Today we're in 2 Samuel chapter 17, and uh, we're going to be looking at what has been referred to as disaster on Absalom. You're going to see that as we go through this passage together, because it's the Lord's intent to deal with Absalom, the son of David, who is attempting to uh, destroy David, his father, and to, and to usurp his authority. He's already stolen the kingdom from his father, and so chapter 17 deals with that. And so let's begin reading at verse 1, 2 Samuel 17. We'll read to verse 3 and get into our study. Moreover, Ahithophel said to Absalom, Now let me choose 12,000 men, and I will arise and pursue David tonight. I will come upon him while he is weary and weak and make him afraid. And all the people who are with him will flee, and I will strike only the king. Then I will bring back all the people to you, when all return except the man whom you seek, all the people will be at peace. Now, as we've been going through Samuel, we have discovered a few things. One is we know that, that King David at this point has, has had to flee the city of Jerusalem because his son Absalom has made a decision that he wants to take the kingdom from his father. And so Absalom has entered into the city as David has exited it because he knew that if he were to remain, David would possibly lose his life. He would certainly lose the life of some of the people who were with him. And therefore, he felt it wiser for him to leave the city, in which he did, and, and to travel to the east. Now, he didn't leave alone. He, he brought citizens with him. He brought his, his bodyguard, as well as a variety of military men. And um, as he was going, not only did they travel with him, but there were others who wanted to accompany him. We, we saw how the priests had wanted to come with him, how that Abiathar and Zadok had wanted to come, how their two sons, uh, Jonathan and, and Ahimaaz, had wanted to come along with him. But, but David had said to them, no, you remain in the city of Jerusalem, and uh, you can actually be my eyes and my ears. If you hear something's going on, you can have it sent to me, and, um, and that would be of greater help if you were to remain behind than for you to travel with me. Then David encountered one of his friends, an older man by the name of Hushai, and Hushai wanted to travel with him. He's a dear friend of David, been a counselor for many years to him, but he was an older man, and he would hinder his travel. He would have been a burden to him. And so, so David says to Hushai, no, you remain behind, and, and, and you can, once again, you can become like eyes and ears, and if there's anything you hear that's taking place, let me know. And so that's what is taking place. He is left behind uh, the priest. He is left behind his counselor, Hushai, as, uh, as this is all taking place. Now, at the same time, Absalom has a counselor, a counselor who formerly was the counselor to David, a man by the name of Ahithophel. Ahithophel hates David. He, he has a deep resentment for him because Ahithophel's granddaughter, Bathsheba, was the one that David had taken, committed adultery with, impregnated, and it was her husband, Uriah, Uriah that uh, David had made sure had died. And, and so Ahithophel, who at one time had been a counselor to David, is now angry at him and desires him to, uh, to die. The Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 12, that hatred stirs up strife. And that's exactly what is taking place in the heart of Ahithophel. And Ahithophel begins now to, instead of advise David, he begins now to be an advisor to his son Absalom. Now, as he has advised Absalom, one of the things he has told him to do is to take the wives, rather the concubines of, of King David, 10 of them who were left behind when David fled Jerusalem, and to erect a tent on top of the house, on the roof of the house, so that all Israel would see when he went in and had physical relations with these concubines. Now, he was doing that in order that uh, it, he might openly declare that he was the one who was occupying the throne. Ahithophel was the one who said for him to do that. And during that time, Ahithophel's advice was so good that, that people would line up to receive it. Remember verse 23 in chapter 16? how it said the advice of Ahithophel which he gave in those days was as, as if one had, had inquired at the oracle of God. So was all the advice of Ahithophel both with David and with Absalom. And so he was known for having wise counsel and he's the one who had counseled Absalom to do what he did in order that he might, he might uh, cause uh, the, the nation of Israel to know that David no longer was in charge and, and that Absalom himself was. And so we get into chapter 17, and now as we enter into chapter 17, Ahithophel is giving advice. And notice with me in verse 1, the advice he begins to give. 
It says here in chapter 17, verse 1, Ahithophel said to, to Absalom, Now let me choose 12,000 men, and I will arise and pursue David tonight. And so basically what he's saying is this. One, I, I want to be appointed a general in your army. I want you to give to me 12,000 soldiers whom I can lead. And, and as I take them and I lead them, what we're going to do is we're going to go and we're going to take care of the business that needs to be taken care of. Now, the bottom line is, is he wants something to be done quickly because it may be that he's afraid that, that Absalom, if given too much time, might not want to kill his father that he might not want to take care of business with his father. You see, Ahithophel wants David dead. And Absalom at this time is doing everything he can to consolidate his power there in Jerusalem. And so if Ahithophel can take 12,000 men, a large force of, of military might, and uh, attack David in a surprise fashion, and make sure David is dead, then he's going to be able to get his vengeance on David because Ahithophel wants David dead. And he's afraid that it's possible that, uh, that Absalom might show mercy. And that's why he's giving him this advice. He wants to take care of business. And he's afraid that David might show mercy, or rather David might find mercy from Absalom if he doesn't deal with him quickly. Bottom line is that, that time has a tendency of healing all wounds, as they say. And, and if you give this enough time, Absalom may lose the fire in his heart against his father. And in doing so... David may find mercy at the hands of Absalom. It's better to take care of business now than later on. Now, so what he says to him is he says, let me do that. Notice in verse 2, he says, I'll come upon him while he is weary and weak and make him afraid. And so, listen, David is tired because of the energy expended in leading the people out of the city. And fatigue has a tendency of leading to despair and sorrow and grief. And, and, and if David is in sorrow and grief and despair, then David may lose his resolve. If he loses his resolve, he'll be easier to take. He's tired right now. Just give me opportunity to come upon him. And his anxiety is surely going to overcome any resolve he might have. It's interesting how Proverbs 12:25 says, Anxiety in the heart of man causes depression. When people are under a lot of stress and strain, and David indeed was, it's, it's possible for them to not think clearly. And, and Ahithophel knows that. And so he's simply saying to Absalom, don't give him time to rest and recuperate. You need to act quickly. Deal with it now. And allow me to take these 12,000 men and we'll take care of business immediately. Not only that, he's saying when David is, is killed, it will demoralize all those who are following after him. Why? Because they'll no longer have a leader. And without a leader, they'll simply lose heart. They'll have nobody to direct them. It's like Zechariah 13, 7 says, Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. If you give me an opportunity, I'll go in. I'll take David. It'll demoralize Israel, and Israel will become yours even in a greater way. And notice in verse 2 how he says, I will strike down only the king. In other words, I'm the one who's going to do it. Absalom, you're not the one who's going to be responsible for the killing of your father. I'll do it, and I'll take responsibility for it. Now, this is going to provide an excuse for Absalom's conscience because it's a horrible thing for a son to kill a father. And then he goes on in verse 3 and says, And I'll bring back all the people to you. When I'll return, accept the man whom you seek. In other words, they're going to return to you and consider you to be king. And that's going to happen because the man whom you seek will be dead. Now, I want you to see this real quickly here. Notice he speaks of David as the man whom you seek. He doesn't call David his father because that might make Absalom have second thoughts. He doesn't want to take, he doesn't want to say, I'll go and kill your father because it'll make Absalom start thinking about the fact that David indeed is his father. When I was in the military many years ago in the Civil War, when I was in the, in the military, the, uh, our drill sergeants and those who trained us, and I have veterans in here, and perhaps it's still true, I'm certain that it is. Those who were training us would use words to describe the enemy that were words that were racial slights. They were racial slights. They called them names. Seeing that we were at war with the Vietnamese at that time, the Vietnamese were given names because it's a, it's, a, it's a tactic that has been used, I guess, in every, every war that's ever been fought. 
is the enemy is dehumanized. They are given a different name because if you give them a different name, then something inside of your mind psychologically responds to the name and not to the fact that this is a, a person with a family and a history and, and dreams and desires. But when he's simply called this name, you have a tendency, I think, of just forgetting that you're killing a person. And so that's how it works. In war, it has always been that way. Ahithophel doesn't want to say, your father's going to die. Because if he says, your father's going to die, that could cause Absalom to begin to consider the fact, that is my father. How can I go about killing my own father? But if he says to him, well, that man whom you seek, it, it depersonalizes the whole thing. It's just a guy that needs to die. And so he's saying to him, look, it, we'll take care of this, and the result will be the nation will be in peace. And the nation will be in peace because people forget quickly. They're going to forget how much they love the King David. They will forget because people have a tendency of doing that. We know that to be true to this day, don't we? You know, somebody who's a hero today is tomorrow's villain. A person that everybody thinks and admires and looks at uh, today and thinks is wonderful today is somebody that tomorrow they may forget immediately. Just think about it. It's true in all of our public life. Think about the music that you listen to today and think about the music that you might have listened to 10 years or 15 years ago or whatever your age may be. And, and things change over the years. There are a lot of things that remain the same, but a lot changes. And the people that were so cool and so great and the styles that were so cool and great, look at them now. You know, like the hippies, the, the hippie garb is, is making a comeback. But the 80s stuff, you know, the orange pants and the, you know, those, those, those pants that Hammer used to wear. I hope they never come back, man. They were ugly and orange and, and all of that. You know, but you see it. And at one time, you, you just had to have that. You had to have that clothing or you had to have that song or that person was the greatest thing in the box office, great hero you know, and all, that's just the way it is. That's just how it is for us. We forget quickly. You know, in a couple of weeks, we're going to have a national holiday. It's, it's, it's Easter, Christmas, and Super Bowl Sunday in the United States. And we, it's a religious holiday. We have all of our friends over. We even have communion, chips and salsa. I mean, that's what happens on Super Bowl Sunday, right? And your neighborhood is going to be filled with people watching the game. That's what happens. It's on Sunday, and people will show up, and, and that's how it works. And, and there are a lot of people who are very devoted to that. They love that game. They love getting together. And, and, and it's really an, uh, a time that they look forward to. And, and they will tell you all, all, all about it. They love it, the commercials and everything else. They enjoy it very much. But the interesting thing about that is they forget. Because if you ask a person who's really into it, I'm not saying somebody who's an expert who makes a living about speaking of this. I'm saying somebody who really likes them and enjoys going to the Super Bowl parties and all of that. If you ask them, who was a Super Bowl champion 18 years ago? What was the score? What were the teams that played? Who was the MVP? Well, most people don't know that. Because immediately you start thinking, 18 years ago, I don't remember who, what, what team. That's just the way it was. That's the way it is with us. Most people can't do that. Most people don't remember who even last year won. That's just the way it is because last year is so last year. What we're looking for is this year. Who's going to win this year? That's how people are. And so David was the hero of Israel. But Absalom has taken over. And if you can have David killed, Ahithophel is saying, if he can be put to death, the people will forget quickly who he was. They'll return to you, and you're going to be the king. And all of this is his plan because he wants David to die. Now, notice verse 4. The saying pleased Absalom and all the elders of Israel. This council advising Absalom as they're listening to the advice of Ahithophel are all pleased with it because they see this as being a good plan. Now it's interesting because what you're seeing here is a plan to basically surprise the king at night and kill him. It's one of these plans where you seize the moment instead of waiting simply. And uh, to wait instead of waiting. And that made sense. And, and also... He would be reminding Dave, uh, Absalom, David was a decisive leader. When something was in front of David, his history was that he would respond to it quickly. And so he's basically saying, listen, Absalom, your father is decisive. Seize the moment. But one of the things that he is not presenting, and this is very important, when David made decisions, remember, as you've studied with me through First and Second Samuel, David had a tendency of inquiring of the Lord first. He prayed first. He didn't just go out and make decisions normally. 
David normally, especially in, in areas of battle, would first seek the Lord in prayer. I want you to notice that Ahithophel is not saying that you need to inquire of the Lord whether this is good or not. He wants to usurp the authority of God as he gives this advice to Absalom. Now, why would he do that? He hated David. Why would Absalom be in favor of that? Because he was angry at his father. They both had something in common, and that was a bitterness towards David, both of them. Listen, this isn't something that just came up in the life of Absalom, and it's certainly something that didn't just come up in the life of Ahithophel. The bottom line is, years have passed, and it took years for this anger to build up. And I want to speak to you about something that I think is very practical at this moment, something that I think that all of us, if we listen, can actually learn from. We, we need to remember something about David. We need to remember that David was a just king and that David was a loving, though ineffective, father. Nobody would argue that in the history of David that David didn't try and rule righteously because he did. And nobody would argue that David didn't love his children because David did. David loved his kids and he loved his nation. But the problem was is that David, though he was a loving father, was ineffective. And so Absalom was angry over his father's actions that dated back with his half-brother Amnon and his sister Tamar. Because when Amnon raped Absalom's full sister Tamar, his father David didn't do anything about it. And that is something that remained stuck in the heart of Absalom. Ahithophel had been carrying anger towards David for years because David had committed adultery with Ahithophel's granddaughter Bathsheba and, as I've said earlier, worked it in such a way that Uriah, her husband, had died. And that is something that has been in his heart for some time. When you think about it, when David fell with Bathsheba, it took her nine months till she finally gave birth and some commentators say that the child was already two or three months old when the child died so that could be as much as a year out of the life of Bathsheba that would be included in the anger of Ahithophel we know that the child died when the baby was around a year old and then a year after that Solomon was born now after that Tamar was raped and Absalom, her brother, waited for two years, and then he killed Amnon. Then he fled for three. Then he returned to two years of isolation in Jerusalem. It could have been in the case of Bathsheba and Ahithophel that around ten years have passed. And in the life of Absalom, several years have passed. So what you have here, in a practical way, is anger that is unresolved, that is bitterness, that is causing them to say the only solution is the death of David. That's what bitterness does in a person's heart. You see, Absalom and Ahithophel are motivated by anger and an unforgiving heart. And it's all coming from the inside of them. Somebody once said, nothing external to you has any power over you. This is all coming from the inside. This is all what's taking place within them. When Jesus was speaking on one occasion, it's found in Mark chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, Jesus said, from within, out of men's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. It's what's inside of us. It's what comes out of us. It's not what's coming on towards us. It's what's coming from us. And from these people, from Absalom and uh, Abimelech, there is this, rather, uh, Abimelech and uh, Ahithophel. What you have here is an anger of the heart that is causing them to, to plan the death of a, of a man who was a loving father but ineffective and a good king. 
Listen, if we don't deal with the anger that we carry sometimes within us, we're capable of doing almost anything, bottom line. If we don't deal with the bitterness that some of us have, you know, have right now, we've been experiencing for some time, then the end result in our life is going to be nothing but pain, bottom line. That's how it works. You know, some of us are like debt collectors. We, you know, somebody has hurt us, and we basically keep that debt in the back of our mind. And, and whenever we have future dealings with them, the only thing that we can remember is what they did to us. Even if it was three years, five years, ten years, or twenty years ago, it stays with us. We don't let it go. We hold on to it. And, and a lot of the times, the ones who have hurt us don't even remember what they did. It is us who keeps that flame, that fire burning. It's, it is us. It's within us that keeps that desire for revenge. I'm going to get even. I'm going to get my pound of flesh. There's something going to have to be done. And that bitterness that can go on inside of us, guys, it will eat us alive. It will destroy us. We have to release it. We have to let it go because if we don't, it will consume us. And in the life of Ahithophel and Absalom, there were years of holding to this anger to the degree that they finally were in agreement that David needed to die. Well, when this plan has been made and it brings pleasure to Absalom and all the elders to hear it, notice verse 5. Absalom said, Now call Hushai the archite also and, and let us hear what he says too. Now Hushai was David's dear friend, but he wasn't part of the council that advised Absalom, so he's inquired of now. He's called in and, and they want to see whether or not he approves Ahithophel's advice. It's possible that they think that Hushai is going to confirm the counsel of Ahithophel. And so they bring him in. And what they do is they begin to speak to him. Notice verse 6. When Hushai came to Absalom, Absalom spoke to him saying, Ahithophel has spoken in this manner. Shall we do as he says? If not, speak up. He made a mistake here. And, and obviously the mistake was of the Lord because I want you to see verse 14. It says, the advice of Hushai the archite is better than the advice of Ahithophel, for the Lord had proposed to defeat the good advice of Ahithophel to the intent that the Lord might bring disaster on Absalom. Bottom line was that Ahithophel's advice was good, but I want you to see what he did. What he did is when Absalom is speaking to Hushai, Absalom tells him everything that Ahithophel had said. And in telling him everything, he's giving to Hushai the opportunity to debate it. He's giving him opportunity to hear what his plan is so that he can formulate something that is contrary to that because that's what Hushai is going to do. See, Hushai is going to give advice to save David's life. A wiser thing would have been if Ahithophel would have called, or rather Absalom would have called Hushai in and would have said to him, I need some advice on how to, to take out David. Tell me what you think. It would have been a better, a smarter thing to do that. But he betrayed, he gave away his cards, he showed him what he was holding. And in doing so, he actually gives to, to Hushai the opportunity to, one, know the plan, and two, to, to countermand it. When I, when I do ministry, very often what I'll do is if I'm looking for ad advice on, on something, is I will ask somebody, what would you do about that? Or how would you handle this? And I listen to them, and I want to know everything, and I'll ask them questions as they begin to speak so I can hear their plan. And then later on, if I speak to somebody else, I'll ask the same question to them. I'm considering doing this, this, uh, what do you think about it? How would you go about it? I don't say, oh, I was speaking to so-and-so, and he said, we should do this, we should do this, we should do this, we should do this. What do you think? Is he right? I don't do that. What I'll say is, I want to do something, what do you think? Give me your advice. And then I compare the advice that I get. Because somewhere in the middle, there's going to be good advice. And sometimes I'll take something here and something from here, and I'll combine them and produce something that feels consistent with what I feel the Lord is leading us in. What happened here is that uh, the advice of Ahithophel was given completely to Hushai. Absalom tells him, and it gives to, uh, to Hushai the opportunity to hear the advice and to, to actually counter it. And that's what he's about to do here. Shall we do as he says? If not, speak up. Verse 7. So Hushai said to Absalom, the advice that Ahithophel has given is not good at this time. For said Hushai, you know your father and his men, that they are mighty men, and they are enraged in their minds, like a bear robbed of her cubs in the field. Your father is a man of war, will not camp with the people. Surely by now he's hidden in some pit or in some other place. It will be when when some of them are overthrown at the first, that whoever hears it will say, 
There's a slaughter among the people who follow Absalom. And even he who is valiant, whose heart is like the heart of a lion, will melt completely. For all Israel knows that your father is a mighty man, and those who are with him are valiant men. Therefore I advise that all Israel be gathered to you, from Dan, which is the north, to Beersheba, which is south, like the sand that is by the sea from multitude, and that you go to battle in person. So we will come upon him in some place where he may be found. We will fall on him as the dew falls on the ground. And of him and all the men who are with him, there shall not be left so much as one. Moreover, if he has withdrawn into a city, then all Israel shall bring ropes to that city, and we will pull it into the river until there is not one small stone found there. So Absalom and all the men of Israel said, The advice of Hushai the archite is better than the advice of Ahithophel. For the Lord had purposed to defeat the good advice of Ahithophel to the intent that the Lord might bring disaster on Absalom. Let's see what he says. Let's see how he deals with this. The first thing I want you to see in verse 7 is he didn't say it wasn't good advice. Notice that. The advice that Ahithophel has given is not good, he says, at this time. So instead of saying it's wrong, he acknowledges that it's good advice, but he doesn't agree with it. In other words, it's a diplomatic way of making a point without an immediate negative response. You see, direct confrontation often makes people defensive. We know this. If somebody's done something that uh, is wrong or, or you have a question about or you just disagree with, and you directly confront them, they don't necessarily tell you how happy they are that you're disagreeing with them. Anybody who's married knows that. I mean, if your wife says something to you, you don't turn to her and say, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. You don't do that if you want to eat. You don't do that. You, you don't do that. You don't say that at all. I mean, you, you learn how to, to hear them out. You learn how to communicate. You learn how to, to disagree in an agreeable fashion. And that's what he's doing here. He's basically saying, this is good advice, but not for the moment. This is good advice, but not at this time. Because Ahithophel is standing there, and if he says, that's just terrible advice, then you're going to have to debate point by point with Ahithophel. So he says, it's good advice. When he says, it's good advice, Ahithophel is, is basically not being called into question. He's not being confronted. It's his advice that's being spoken about at this time, and as a result of that, he's going to remain silent as Hushai begins to speak. And so it's a diplomatic way of making a point without an immediate negative response. He goes on in verse 8 and he says, You know your father and his men, they're mighty men. So by comparison, he now reminds Absalom that David is a battle-tried warrior and Absalom is not. And he's saying, You know your father, at least I do, I know him from personal experience. Your father, and you need to know what your father does when he's cornered. Your father fights. Your father's not weary. Your father is not weak. And he certainly is not afraid. And anyway, as a battle-hardened veteran, he is not amongst the people right now. He's hidden in some pit. He's in some other place. So if you send your forces into the camp, he's not even going to be there. He's in hiding. How can Ahithophel kill someone who isn't even there? Not only that, but the troops are going to be enraged. And they're going to end up slaughtering Ahithophel's troops because David's troops are inspired. So instead of taking David by surprise, Ahithophel himself and his troops could end up dead. That's going to that's gonna upset your army, and many of them may defect. He goes on to say in verse 10, And even he who is valiant, whose heart is like the heart of a lion, will melt completely. When your men are routed, it will cause even the most brave to become afraid. And your father will receive greater glory than he already has, and you will look weak. And therefore, I advise that you simply gather all of Israel together from the north to the south because it's wiser to take the time to gather your forces from throughout Israel in order to be prepared. This is also going to unify the nation to oppose David and you will be greatly respected. It will also buy time for David and he's going to be able to rest and be prepared for such an encounter. Now as all of this is going down, verse 14, they like the advice of Hushai. Now, why did they receive it? It's because, he says, God determined to undermine the counsel of Ahithophel, even though Ahithophel's advice was very good. In the book of Job, in chapter 5, verse 12, it says that God frustrates the devices of the crafty so that their hands cannot carry out 
their plans. And that's what we see take place here. The psalmist in Psalm 71 and 2 said, Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Let them be ashamed and confounded who seek my life. Let them be turned back and confused who desire my hurt. And that's what the Lord does. He confounds the advice. He has purpose to defeat the good advice of Ahithophel to the intent that the Lord might bring disaster on Absalom. And that's what's happening. Absalom is going to be destroyed. Now, verse 15, Hushai said to Zadok and Abiathar the priests, Thus and so Ahithophel advised Absalom and the elders of Israel, and thus and so I have advised. Now therefore, send quickly and tell David, saying, Do not spend this night in the plains of the wilderness, but speedily cross over, lest the king and all the people who are with him be swallowed up. And so David's original purpose in leaving them behind is now fulfilled so they can bring information to him. Now, verse 17, Jonathan and Ahimaaz stayed at Enrogel, for they dared not be seen coming into the city. So a female servant would come and tell them, and they would go and tell King David. Nevertheless, a lad saw them and told Absalom. But both of them went away quickly and came to a man's house in Bahurim, who had a well in his court, and they went down into it. Then the woman took and spread a covering over the well's mouth and spread around and spread ground grain on it, and uh, the thing was not known. And when Absalom's servants came to the woman at the house, they said, Where are Ahimaaz and Jonathan? So the woman said to them, They've gone over the water brook. And when they had searched and could not find them, they returned to Jerusalem. Now it came to pass, after they had departed, that they came up out of the well, went and told King David, said to David, Arise, cross over the water quickly, for, for thus has Ahithophel advised against you. So David and all the people who were with him arose and crossed over the Jordan. By morning light, not one of them was left who had not gone over the Jordan. Now, when Ahithophel saw that his advice was not followed, he saddled a donkey and arose and went home to his house, to his city. Then he put his household in order and hanged himself and died. And he was buried in his father's tomb. Why did he kill himself? I want to spend some time looking at this with you. Why did he kill himself? Well, the easy answer would be because he was angry that his advice was rejected. There's truth to that. Hushai had given contrary advice. Ahithophel, being a proud man, would have been upset that his advice was not taken, and there's a certain degree of pride involved in that. But is that why he would kill himself? The answer has to be no. Why would you kill yourself because your advice was rejected? It has to go a little deeper. How about this? How about the fact that he knows that Hushai's advice is going to lead to David's victory over Absalom? And that ultimately when David has victory over Absalom, David's going to start coming looking for those who betrayed him. And how about the fact that Ahithophel is the one who is advising Absalom concerning what to do and therefore would be concerned that David upon capturing Ahithophel would put him to death. It would seem to me that the reason he goes out to kill himself found its basis in the fact that he did not trust in the mercy that David might have shown him. And in that I think he could have made a large mistake because David, as much as, as, as a warrior as he is, and as, as great as a general as he is, is also known as a man of compassion. David had been broken. David had been broken over his sin with Bathsheba and Uriah. David knew that he was bearing the uh, result of that because of God's word to him through Nathan the prophet. David knew even when he was fleeing and Shimei was there cursing him and throwing dirt in the air and throwing rocks at him, David said, perhaps his curses have been ordered of the Lord and maybe God will show me mercy as a result of this. David had a humility of heart. And here's where the mistake could have been made by, by, uh, by, uh, by Ahithophel and that is, it is possible that Ahithophel could have trusted that David might show him mercy and he did not have to go out and kill himself. Because David was a man who was broken 
men who are broken have a tendency of showing mercy to other men who are broken. As I've said with you before, when you're a young person, you may think that you've got it all hammered down. You've got it all down. You, you haven't failed in some ways. You're still young. You haven't had life opportunities. You haven't had the greater temptations before you. Circumstances haven't surrounded you that make it seem easier to compromise than to speak the truth. As you're growing older, you find yourself in different situations, different places, and different hard decisions to make. And sometimes we're not always successful in, in, in holding fast to what we know is true. And sometimes we can fail. When you're first married, you, you're in your honeymoon phase and, and everything seems to be good the first year or so. You think everything's going fine. After a while, you begin to have children. After a while, you start to have more, little, more problems. You start going through financial situations. You start discovering things about one another that you didn't know when you were dating. You didn't know some of the things that, about that woman or that man when you were dating that come out once they're married. Once that rings on their finger, aha, I got you and this is who I really am. You know, when Marie and I were dating and everything, everything she liked, I liked too. Everything. What kind of food do you like? Oh, I like spaghetti. Oh, man, I love spaghetti. You know, what kind of music do you like? I like Western music. Hot dogs, so do I. I hate it. I hate that kind of music. She found out. But you know what? I mean, you find these things out. I mean, you go through life experiences with one another and you begin to discover things. And, and after a while, you begin to realize that you really don't know all about that person that you thought you knew and you don't know all about life the way you thought you did. And as you're growing older and older and older, you have more opportunities and experiences to grow in maturity. And by that, you begin to, if you're walking with the Lord, you begin to have more humility because you begin to look back in the past and realize that how arrogant or obnoxious or self-centered or self-righteous you were how opinionated you were because you were young you knew it all you knew everything when I was 20 years old I knew everything I knew much more at 20 than I do now at 59 I knew everything you know just ask me you don't even have to ask me I'll tell you just give me a few minutes as you grow older you begin to see your own warts as you grow older you begin to realize that you're not quite what you wanted to be. And that, instead of causing you to become depressed, that causes you to become humble. And as you keep walking with the Lord, and you begin to see Jesus more clearly for what He is, you cannot help but see yourself for who you are. You see, the closer you get to Jesus Christ in your walk with God, the more you see of yourself that is not like Him. So rather than you having this self-righteous, judgmental, arrogant and attitude towards other people, you begin to be broken. David was broken. David at one time was the hero of Israel. He was handsome. He was a songwriter. He could sing like an angel. He was intellectual. He was everything that a man would like to be, a hero above all heroes. But David blew it with Bathsheba, and God broke him through Nathan the prophet. And he was a broken man. And I do have a suspicion that Ahithophel just didn't know the kind of man David had become. You might have some people in your life you haven't seen for 10 years. You go to the 10-year reunion or whatever. You haven't seen them in 10 years. And they think you're the same person you were 10 years ago. They do. They think you're the same person. Some of them are. There's hardly anything sadder than seeing an old man like me trying to be cool. Come on, Grandpa, stop that. <laughs> or an old woman who thinks she's sexy, please help me. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> get on your walker and get out of here. <laughs> I shouldn't say that, but I do. They don't change. Some people don't. But you did. You got saved. And you're not the same person you were at 17 at that 10-year reunion. You're a 27-year-old individual who's matured. You're now married. You've got kids. You're serving the Lord. Your life has changed. And you've grown. Some haven't. You go to the 20-year, as I have, and they're still trying to act cool. 
but now they can put their beers on their pot bellies. <laughs> still trying to be cool, still trying to act cool, still trying to dress cool, still acting like they're in high school. And it's sad. And you look at them and you say, hmm, God, help me. Help me to grow up. And you do. You grow up in the things of the Lord. You have decisions you make and you begin to discover that things aren't as easy as they seemed at first. There are battles that I have to fight sometimes every day. Sometimes they last for years. They have a way of wearing away that pride and it's replaced by, by patience and long-suffering and the fruit of the Spirit and grace and mercy and understanding and depth. You see, David had been broken. Ahithophel, well, his granddaughter had fallen with David probably at least 10 years before, and David had been broken. Ahithophel, instead of falling on his face before David saying, be merciful to me, I have been behind the plans to put you to death because I have been so angry and hurt at you over what happened with Bathsheba that I haven't been able to have one night of sleep since. And I have been plotting and plotting ways to see you die and suffer. And I have to tell you, I have to cast myself on the mercy of God in you. And I'm asking you to show me mercy. Ahithophel, I think, could have done that, but he didn't. For him, the only answer, I'm going to kill myself. I'll kill myself. You see, that's where that'll take you. Bitterness is the road to death in one way or another. Oh, you might live 50 years bitter, but you're just as good as dead. There's no life. There's no taste to life anymore. There's, there's just no joy in life anymore because the bitterness, the bitterness that, you're, that, you, that you harbor, it, it's, it's kind of like a, a precious, some kind of precious possession you have. You, you wrap it up and you put it in a little box, and every once in a while you open up the box and unwrap it, and you look at the bitterness, and, oh, yeah, I remember what they did to me, and you close back up, put it away for a while. Then when you start losing some of that anger, you go back and you open that box up. Oh, yeah, I remember what they did to me. I haven't forgotten yet. Wrap it back up and put it away again. That's what people do with bitterness. You can let it go, but you don't. It becomes a treasure. You know where it is at any given moment, and it can come out at any time. It can come out in an argument. I remember what you did 15 years ago. I haven't forgotten yet. I may forgive, but I don't forget. Then you're not really forgiving because you're holding on to something and you're using it as a wedge, you're using it as a tool, you're using it as a hammer, a sword, or an ax to take somebody's head off. That's what you're doing with it. And that person that you're bitter with will never ever know the joy of the forgiveness that you could have offered because you simply had a whole fast that Ahithophel was willing to keep that till he killed himself over it. We have to be careful about these kinds of things because they are destructive. And he went out and hanged himself. I wonder what would have happened if Ahithophel would have said, I'm going to cast myself on the mercy of David to see what David will do if I ask him to forgive me. We'll never know because he killed himself. Then David went to Mahanaim and Absalom crossed over the Jordan. He and all the men of Israel with him. And Absalom made Amasa captain of the army instead of Joab. This Amasa was the son of a man whose name was Jithra, an Israelite, who had gone in to Abigail, the daughter of Nahash, sister of Zeruiah, Joab's mother. So Israel and Absalom encamped in the land of Gilead. The land of Gilead is, if you're looking at a map of Israel, you have the Jordan River just over the eastern border of the Jordan there, a little uh, region of uh, Jerusalem going up a bit is of the land of Gilead. Now it happened when David had come to Mahanim, that Shovi, the son of Nahash from Rabbah of the people of Ammon, Machir the the uh, son of Amiel from Lodivar, and Barzillai, the Gileadite from Rogelim, brought beds and basins, earthen vessels and wheat, barley and flour, parched grain and beans, lentils and parched seeds, honey and curds, sheep and cheese of the herd for David and the people who were with him to eat. For they said, the people are hungry and weary and thirsty in the wilderness. Two things and we'll close. Amasa is now appointed to replace Joab as general over the army. And what's interesting about this is that Amasa is David's nephew. He was born to David's sister, Abigail. 
which made him cousin of Absalom, Joab, and Abishai. And so they encamp east of the Jordan in a region called Gilead. But you also have somebody here named Shobi, who is called the son of Naash from Rabbah, who is an Ammonite. We'll look at that for just a moment and close. David had displaced his brother, Hanun. Hanun was the one who had disgraced David's ambassadors in chapter 12. It's possible that Shobi had been put in power and in gratitude cares for the needs of David. It's interesting to me how it says in verse 28 that he brought beds and basins, earthen vessels and wheat, but he also brought him some beans. Man, that must have been good. And they had some kind of saw that it was just great <laughs> one of the things I'll close with this is this David had shown kindness to this man and in response the man showed kindness to David I've discovered that when you have a kind and generous heart towards people that people have a tendency of reciprocating they have a tendency of responding in the way that you responded to them David had been careful with this man he had replaced Hanun his brother with this man Shobi and Shobi shows to him his appreciation by taking care of his needs and in a way Christians are very generous and we have a tendency of you see a need we have a tendency of meeting that need that's because we're, we're children of the king and our God is generous with us so when you see a need and it's in your hand it's empower your hand to do something good for somebody you have a tendency of doing that simply because that's what we do that's what believers do is we help people but the bottom line is, is we do it not to receive anything. We do it because it's more blessed to give than to receive. Yet I have just discovered that some people, upon receiving some good, it touches them to such a degree that they want to do good for somebody else. And in the case of Shoei, what happened is he had been placed in a position by David, and now he finds that David is in need, and he takes care of David in the needs that David has. And that's generally how it works. He has been put into power, but he also has the ability to help David. And out of gratitude for what David has done, he responds and helps him. The people are hungry and weary and thirsty in the wilderness, therefore I'll help them. And that's what believers do to this day. We use that as an example of what we as believers ought to do. If they're hungry, weary, and thirsty in a wilderness, God has given us the ability to help them, which we ought to do.